Welcome to another episode of Don't Call It Small. I'm your host, Natasha Foreman. If you don't know me and you have no clue what this podcast is all about, let me share a bit. I'm a lead management consultant at Foreman and Associates LLC, where we provide consulting and professional development services. And Don't Call It Small is where we talk all things business, share tips and news that you can use, and highlight the people and ideas behind the products and services that we buy. To learn more about our team, please visit foremanllc.com. That's F-O-R-E-M-A-N-L-L-C dot com. Hello, everyone. Oh, my goodness. It's so great to be here with you today. I am so excited about today's episode. The focus on our baby boomers. Baby boomers. Yes. I have um, something that's near and dear to my heart. And so I'm, I'm really honored to be able to um, have spent the time to, to do some digging. And um, I have a lot that I want to share. So first things first, I want to share a quote from that's attributed to, um, to Warren Buffett. It says that someone's sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. And tying that all into today's conversation, the baby boomer generation accounts for roughly 2.3 million small businesses in the United States, which that is a cumulative employment number of roughly 25 million people. And if you're not quite sure of the age range, the year, the date of birth type of scenario, um, baby boomers are anyone that's born between the years 1946 and 1964. They make up the second largest population of small business or franchise owners, representing 41% of small business or um, franchise owners. Second, second only to my generation. Gen X um, at 44%. 23% of boomer small business or franchise owners are women, while 77% are male. 23% are women, 77% are male. And it's no secret that the population of uh, the United States is aging, right? It's, It's clear. And we're seeing a shift in our demographics as 72 million baby boomers are approaching that retirement range. And the question is, are they retiring employees or business owners? Because that impacts the country in two unique ways. The first is with retiring employees, a knowledge and resource gap is created in the exodus of great experience and grit, um, that tenacity, the tough skin Um, It makes recruiting, training, and positioning younger workers to step in, and it's that's a difficult transition. We're going to save that for another episode because that is a a major concern that um, retirees as well as um, businesses that are trying to fill that gap with a retiree um, exiting out. We're going to save that for another episode. And then... When we look at our retiring business owners, if they don't have a succession plan that positions their company to be taken over by a family member or a partner, um, have they chosen to sell the business? And if so, to whom? Um, If not, that creates a whole nother dilemma. And what we're going to do is we're going to table that. We're going to put a pin in that um, and we'll explore this during another episode because there's a lot of factors that go into that and there are a lot of implications for gen x gen y and gen z um tied to that so those are going to be two separate episodes or i don't know maybe they'll be combined as one but that we're tabling both of those topics for later now, what we've also seen over the last few years has been a shift from the plurality of small business owners who are baby boomers, right? So 41% 
to the 44 to 46% that are Gen X, right? Um, you know, the numbers, depending on who's doing the research, the numbers are up down a little bit by one to 2%. Uh, right now we have uh, millennials that make up 13% of small business owners. And then about 1% are Gen Z, which folks are calling them now Zoomers. In 2020, Guidant uh, Financial and SBTA companies surveyed over 3,100 small business and franchise owners nationwide. And um, of their survey results, 28% of the respondents said that their readiness to be their own boss was their biggest motivation for going into business for themselves. It's the most popular motivation. That's usually the case for anyone, regardless of age or gender or anything else, any other demographic checkbox. That's usually the, the primary driver. Um, and then you see a 12% increase in the share year over year. The second most popular response was the desire to pursue their own passion. That was at 19% of the respondents. The third most popular was uh, the opportunity presented itself, so they jumped at it. Uh, you know, caused by a life experience like divorce, for instance. The um, then when you look at that after right after that, the dissatisfaction with corporate America came in at 14%. And although the fifth most popular business motivation, um, which was really interesting, a 19% increase in boomers who started a business because they weren't ready to retire. So we're looking at roughly 86% of business owners over the age of 50 got into business ownership through starting or buying independent businesses and 14% purchased franchises. Now, when we look at some of the uh, entry ways and some of the barriers, cash remains the most utilized form of small business or franchise financing for boomers, where 36% of respondents using it to fully or partially fund their business. And that's a 15% increase year over year. And then we see that the rollovers for business startups, the um, ROBS, the R-O-B-S, is also popular. And I'm going to share with you what that um, stands for. It's, um, you have a 16% of respondents using this method of funding that's also known as a 401k business financing. Then you have 12% of boomers used a line of credit for startup financing. And that's a 14% increase um, from the year prior. And notably, there was a 30% decrease in boomers who had help from friends and family year over year. There's a decrease, 30% decrease in boomers who had help from friends and family year over year. And there's a whole bunch of different variables that can come into play, right? For the reason for that decrease. What we see is that um, the industry's boomers are starting their businesses um, and it, the, the reasons are varying greatly. You have um, 13% of all respondents, uh, companies, two of the most popular industries are business services and retail. Right there with both the, um, and I was, there was something that came, just came to my mind. It just flashed in, but if it comes back, I'll I'll share. Then you have constructing and contracting businesses that come in at 12%. So, we have the two most popular are business services and retail, followed by constructing and contracting, right close behind. We have residential and commercial services, and those are like our janitorial work, landscaping. Those come in next at nine percent. Then at the the rounding off the top five, um, we have food and restaurants at eight percent. And you're looking at this, and some of you may say, okay if those aren't the areas that I am traditionally, if I've been accustomed to working in, you know, is that something that I'm trying to dive into? And I'm right now, I'm gonna tell you, you wait a minute, you're getting ahead of yourself. So just wait before we get there. As with most other segments that were surveyed, some of the biggest challenges for a boomer, small business or franchise owners is the lack of capital or cash flow. And this is the case 
um, for other startups and is not necessarily tied to age. Um, but we can definitely see this, especially if your finances are tied up in other, you know, areas, right? If you have them in other, in other buckets and the share of boomer businesses that are encountering challenges with recruiting and retaining new employees has risen a significant 36%, um, from the the prior year and 19% of the share calling it their biggest challenge. And so when you're dealing with this, um, these are all of course, um, intimidating, especially as I'll dive into more about how dealing with the pandemic makes that a greater challenge. So when we look at, um, what some of the business owners, the boomer business owners, um, have said that about 12% more of the owners would invest in staff year over year if possible. And then marketing and advertising round out the top three business challenges for boomers with 13% of respondents citing it as their greatest difficulty. So it's interesting that I am presenting an opportunity for boomers to start businesses. But if you're, if you're also a boomer who's listening and you're like, wait a minute, I have, (laughs) I've got the marketing and advertising chops to, you know, market my services to the startups, right? You may have a, um, other skill sets that could meet these needs. So this is a, a dual kind of, uh, I knew that this what just came to me. It's a this is a dual benefit here versus what I have seen in all my research over the past few weeks when I was re, you know doing digging on this was there are so many different articles and blog posts and so on and so forth that is talking to the younger generations about how to you know have as a target audience the boomers. But it was really, it was like, it it was as though they weren't a relevant conversation to have as far as how could boomers also have other boomers as a target audience. Like, it was really interesting. Like, but the articles were, hey, like, this is how you go after the old folk. Like, that's kind of like the gist of it. And I'm thinking from the perspective of a boomer, wow, this is how you, you see us, huh? <laughs> so it's that's something else that I would say to all of you that are marketers or you are um, consulting in some regard is being mindful of that um, the ways in which you are pitching opportunities for um, other businesses to um, target an audience understand that even that audience um, can be uh, positioned in the same way. So, um, that's just something just, I noticed I was going through. It was really interesting. Now I mentioned the pandemic and when we factor that in, there are some things to consider. And this is regardless of the age of the owner at the start of the pandemic, some industries of course were hit much harder than, um, than most, right? We just, it was just obvious in the top three industry categories, that um, business owners reported not being profitable in 2020 were food and restaurant at 14%, health, beauty, and fitness at 12%, and retail at 11%. And the industries that thrived um, included, unsurprisingly, it was healthcare, business services, and home improvement. So regardless of industry, it, I mean, we, we were all affected, right? There was few businesses that were not affected by this pandemic. And when asked how it has affected their business, the most common response um, was about 23% of the respondents said that, of course, they, it was a loss of revenue. The second most common effects to businesses were um, temporarily closing at 11% and reducing their budget 11%. And then 10% of owners had to cut their own salaries. So that was another um, drastic response that people were forced to deal with over these past um, two years. 
while when we look at Americans over the age of 65, they represent 17% of the population, they control 38% roughly of the U.S. net wealth. And those that are 50 and over control 76% of the net wealth of U.S. households. Boomers alone control 54% of total wealth and make up more than 56% of the U.S. households with over a million dollars in assets. And that's not counting primary residences. But it must also be clear, (laughs) right, that while many boomers are doing quite well, many, 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 many more are not. And this is reflected in the quite sizable difference between the median Um, which is just over 200,000. And the average was about 1.2 million um, household net worth of boomers. So when you see the extraordinary wealth of a small percentage of boomers, you have to also know that this number skews the average to the upside. And it threatens to really obscure the fact that half of those in this particular generation have a worth of 200,000 or less. So... That is something that we have to always be mindful of as well. And so whether you are, you know, consulting or coaching or just giving advice to a boomer about their, um, how they pursue their career and their, um, their life moving forward is taking that in consideration. You really do need to know where they stand and how they stand and you know how they have positioned themselves and plan the um and plan for the next you know 20 30 40 years depending on what end of that uh generational spectrum they're on right are they at the 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 front end or the tail end of their generation so when we take a look back um in the 1930s you know it's less you know gosh it's weird to say it's like less than 100 years ago. Um, the life expectancy was 62 and the average retirement age was 72. And when you think about it, a lot of people didn't live long enough to retire. Or if they did, it was only a handful of years that they had. It's like you work, 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 work. You retire and then poof, a few years later, if you made it to retirement, you passed. Today, we see people are living much longer and... Um, We also see that those company pension plans have largely disappeared. Um, And that was strategic. Like they didn't, (laughs) they didn't, they didn't just disappear. They were disappeared, right? Um, We see the 70% of baby boomers expect to work past the age of 65. And I have friends and family members that are baby boomers that are definitely working past the age of 65. I have family members and, and friends who are in their 70s, um, right? Uh, so uh, the thing is, is they're expecting to work or or they're already doing so, right? Um, or they don't plan to retire. So many will continue to work out of economic necessity um, with longer lifespans leading to the need to fund longer retirements. It's just the true and true. So I saw where Greenleaf Trust um, has shared that many boomers find that their 401ks and personal savings are insufficient. And then, of course, because they don't have the company pension plans um, and um, they don't necessarily have the fund to that is required to live the type of lifestyle that they desire. So they're choosing to work um, for those reasons. Now, there are also many who are choosing to work for non-financial reasons, including because they want to, you know, stay mentally sharp. They want to challenge themselves or stay physically active or maintain some type of social connection and and they want to avoid boredom. I know a lot of people um, in, uh, we have the, that have said that they've had friends who retired and did not stay engaged in different activities and didn't have that socialization. And they realized they started equating that with the reason why there was, you know, a quick exodus, right. Of passing away. And so we're seeing that message kind of passed down um, over the years that, Hey, 
this is one way to stay, to keep yourself mentally engaged because that brain is a muscle. And if it's not being exercised and used, it's going to atrophy. So those that are working are often doing work quite different than what they did in their more traditional career. We see those shifts. And many are starting their own businesses and focusing on applying those skills in new ways. And that's something that I always stress is that what skills do you have? Okay, so then how can you apply those skills in a new way, in an innovative way, a creative way, so that it it may not be the exact same way. And as people of course, are, you know, we're tapping into um, healthier living. Um, We're also redefining what retirement is and what it's not. And so it might be more accurate to say that people are, some people are just rejecting the idea altogether of retiring. I like to call it rewirement. Um. <laughs> And that's what I plan on doing. I don't plan on retiring. I plan on rewiring rather than work toward a retirement that is basically all rest without work and responsibilities. What you end up doing is leveraging your skills and you pursue your passions, right? To live your best life in a a way that you package. So that could be starting your own business. That could be... um, a you know a freelance consultant or whatever it could be working part time for another company and it could very well be that you're still working full time you know that you're in your 70s working full time you're like what <laughs> i can do this <laughs> so you know these are all the ways in which i always tell people to reimagine the box oftentimes you know people put themselves in a box and i i, I shared um I don't know if it was one of my blogs or if it's the book I'm, I'm writing on right now where I said, I'm not an object. Don't put me in a box. So with that, um, so if you, if one of my books come out or whatever, <laughs> we can see if that's where it was. But I remember writing it yesterday, but I'm not an object. So I don't put me in a box. I won't be defined by this box. I'm not going to be stuck in this. And so when we can reimagine it, we can reimagine our life and in all that it is, are you working to just, you know, to, to die? Like, you know, does that make sense? Like you work, 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 and there's nothing really that it, the payoff of it, right? Because you're like, how many people, you know, work 20, 30 years and they never took vacations or, you know, or even if they were on a family trip, it seemed like the job was still calling on them and having expectations and they had to drop everything to, to do everything for work where you really didn't get to live. Is that what you're really doing all this for? And so when you're seeing people that are saying, wait a minute, I got to get these these priorities in order. And I think the pandemic has been very beneficial in that in saying, hold up, what's most important to me? And I, so we talk about, of course, um, this, this great exodus of people. We have folks that are quitting jobs, but we're also having people um, and our baby boomers included that are redefining what that work-life balance really means to them and how they want to um, pursue their careers and their, you know, the lifestyles that they want to live. So I was checking to see, you know, some of the states that probably have many of our boomer startups and, um, you know, the top five that were there were California, Florida, Texas, New York, North Carolina. And, um, you know, of course, you know, with the pandemic clobbering most of us, it'll be interesting to see the data for 2021, 2022, to, because it's like t- these, you know, everyone is like doing a lot of shifting. So it'll be really interesting to see those numbers. Now, of course, as I mentioned earlier, I shared some of the various obstacles that we face, but, um, you know, the majority of would-be business owners say they need roughly you know, $100,000 or so to start their businesses. Almost half say they don't have enough capital to get their business off the ground. But we do see that 46% admit um, one problem is that they don't know enough about financing options. So they don't know what they don't know. And that's what's hurting them, right? About three in 10 say their credit score disqualifies them from certain financing options, while 19% don't want to take on any debt. So then because they don't know the other options, you just kind of sit back and say, oh gosh, I don't know what I'm doing. I guess I keep riding this wave with my current employer. 
Um, even though I, you know, feel like pulling out every strand of my hair, <laughs> right? There could that be the opportunity. So, or not that opportunity, but that could be someone's, their perceived reality. Um, so in addition to capital, there's some other issues that we find. Um, about 40% of people said they haven't identified the right opportunity. 28% said they're not sure where to get started. 14% said they're not ready to leave their job yet. And 13% said there's a lack of support system. So of course, these are these are definitely big issues. And these are the issues that we have regardless of age. But when we're looking specifically at our boomers, this is huge because they're already at retirement age. Right? They're already at retirement age. Um so to look at how to possibly rewire and whether or not that rewirement strategy is starting a business or if it means something else, this is something that I'm sure I already know that the vast majority of boomers didn't expect things to be like it is, you know, especially when they looked at their parents and grandparents generations and they're saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm gonna get this big job and I'm gonna have this and I'm gonna have my, my house with my white picket fence and da, 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 da. Um, you, they didn't expect some of these variables that come in as we start transitioning from different, um, cultural shifts, right. Uh, and, and it's, and not just in the U S but globally, So it's a lot to try to navigate through. And this is something that my generation, Gen X, needs to be mindful of. Because if we're watching our parents and our friends, because understand that the the boomers are so close to our generation that we have friends and siblings that are in that generation. Um, Because of that, right, um, if you don't, learn from that, you're going to be right in the same position in just a few years (laughs) because some of us are close to retirement age ourselves. So these are all different things to um, consider. Now, there is a, um, a report that was done last year. It was called the Four Pillars of the New Retirement, and that was by Edward Jones in New Age. And um, they showed that retirees identified the important elements of well-being as health, positive relationships, and close social connections, a sense of purpose and financial security. So think about that. The elements of well-being, health, positive relationships and close social connections, a sense of purpose, and financial security. Boom. Is that not what most of us are really seeing as our four pillars? Forget retirement, just in general. Is that not what we all, most of us are are looking at and pursuing? So owning a business could very well be one of the few activities that could possibly serve all four pillars of retirement, excuse me, rewirement. It's a possibility. But the question is, should you? And this is something I always say because folks are always trying to push people onto the entrepreneurship train. And I always say it's not meant for everyone. Not everyone's wired for it. So, you know, there are some things like, should you? And some things to consider if you are a baby boomer. Um, I found an article written by um, Jacob Schroeder for Kiplinger. And it says... Um, do you have a passion or hobby that you want to pursue in retirement, right? And so this is key because if you have something that you want to pursue in retirement, that could be something that you rewire to do as a business that ha- gives you the that zest and that invigoration and whatever, right? Um that you would have received from the hobby, but now you're getting paid to do so. So that's a possibility. A second thing is, do you have the financial resources that you can afford to put toward it? Because it is a great investment. 
and for depending on the industry or the product or the service or however you're rolling out, it can be a, um, a great investment. Um, number three is, do you lack the financial resources to retire and may need to work? So this may be something that you are working and then you start up your business on the side, which is something that we tell other people to do. Um, you may need to collaborate, partner with someone in order to make that happen. Or you create your business and you roll it out in segments so that you're able to test your the market, test your product, your service, see if this is something that you know you really want. You know, you're kind of getting your feet wet before you dive into the deep end. So there's different factors in that. And then of course, um, does the another question is, does the thought of a traditional retirement bore you? Do you still seek the gratification and challenges that come along with working? And for so many of us, yeah, you know, you, there's something about it. And so that may be something that helps to really kick you in the butt and get you moving forward. So if you answered yes to any of those questions, you know, starting a business may suit you. It may be appropriate for you. It may work for you. In that case, there is some advice that can help get you started. First thing first is that I want you to remember this um, self, uh, Seth Gold, um, Golden quote. And he said, you have everything you need to build something far bigger than yourself. So I really want you to like take that all in. You already have, I'm speaking to the baby boomers, folks. You already have everything you need to build something far greater than your, bigger than yourself. Now, of course, this is to everyone else, but I'm speaking directly to them. And the reason why is because sometimes um, we see, and then in my conversations with various baby boomers, has been a feeling that I don't know what I can do. And I've had these conversations the past few years with baby boomers who are, they're either at retirement, they're at retire, like they can retire right now. <laughs> they can retire and they're still working. Um, but they don't know. They, they don't think that they they have anything to be able to do anything different or they, I don't know what I want to do. I, I'm confused. And I think what it is, is that they haven't taken an inventory of their skills and, and their gifts and what they possess, right? So as I've said in previous episodes, if we do our own personal SWOT analyses and we sit back and when we look at our strengths and our weaknesses, and then we also look at the opportunities that are around us, that are ahead of us, the potential threats that could derail us, can make our confidence think that we um, are, you know, are worthless or whatever, when we look at all these different factors and we share it with someone who um, wants the best for us and that will invest in us, whether it's financial or just with great energy, um, that can be the boost that we need. But we need to always remember that you have everything you need to build something far bigger than yourself. Don't you place limits on yourself because of your age. Don't do it. Um, So I do want to share some resources and I'll make sure that the um, links to all of these are in our podcast, uh, the episode description, as well as on our blog and um, other resources. So the first resource, which it will be mentioned more than once, is the senior course of um, retired executives, which is SCORE. The U.S. Small Business Administration, the SBA, they um, also, they have links to their district offices, score chapters, and other resources. And so I'll provide that for you. It's sba.gov, and then it's, um, they have the different tools that you can access. So I'll make sure that's there. And then there are SBA resources for people over age 50. Um, So I'll provide the link for that. Um, from the sba.gov site. And then there's the SBA Learning Center, which they have the Encore Entrepreneurs. Encore Entrepreneurs is my way of saying rewirement. Really cool, huh? It's your Encore. Um, And so they have the Encore Entrepreneurs, an introduction to starting your own business. So that link will be provided as well as a link to AARP's tips on starting a new business. And then the Kaufman Foundation has a fast track for 50 plus year olds. So I will provide that link. 
And then there's Aging 2.0, which is an organization that promotes innovation to improve the lives of seniors. So they have an Aging 2, the Aging the Number 2.com. And then we have the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Um, they have a center on aging and work at Boston College. And so they provide research and information about multi um, generational workforce. And so I will provide the link for that as well. And then there's the Senior Entrepreneurship Works. And they have entrepreneurship and aging education and training information. Really cool. And their website is seniorentrepreneurshipworks.org. And I, I'm so excited to be able to share these resources with all of you. So before we um, wrap up, there are some business startup ideas that I want to share. Here's just a few, especially if you're thinking about or you're or if you currently are retired, but if you're thinking about retirement. Um, so of course, I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again, consulting services. So if you're, um, this could be a good fit if, if you... Um, have experience in a certain area, uh, focus, um, whether it's project or product related, service related, whatever, um, because you can now provide these services based on your previous or current work experience. So you can just repackage yourself from what you currently have are doing or what you did in the past and that you were passionate about. Maybe you had a pivot and you, um, you know, you always were like, gosh, I was, this is something I really want to do. You can be able to provide consulting services. Something else is um, if you are um, taxes and bookkeeping, and many entrepreneurs need a little help managing the books. So if you have a background, a degree, if your day job is involved with tax prep or accounting, then you might want to consider providing financial consulting services. See, you can do some taxes and bookkeeping. Uh, a third one is creative products. So are you a crafter? You know, are you a quilter, woodworker, a great artist? If so, you may be able to earn some extra cash by selling your creative wares online and maybe at local markets and fairs. You can have some type of strategic alliances to, uh, you know, sell your products through other established um, retailers. Then there's an option to be a tutor. We see, of course, we've seen this uh, traditionally where retired teachers and librarians are uniquely are aligned with that. Um, but we're seeing more and more professionals who were like, wait a minute, this is something that I'm really good at. And we're um, seeing that with competition, of course, becoming so intense at a lot of our colleges, um, a lot of parents are willing to pay to have private tutoring to help get their, you know, their kids ready. Um, and, and whether it's for SAT prep or college essay writing, just tons of different tutoring options out there. And here's a great thing is that um, you can set your own rates and hours. So you can tutor as many students as you want, whenever you want. And, um, you know, we're seeing tutors salaries of, you know, 45 and, and $60 an hour. Um, so there's, you can do a lot of research in that. Um, those of you that are great at writing or proofreading or editing, um, you could, you know, write press releases and copy for company websites or blogs or their sales and marketing materials. There's, there's an endless list of things that you can do in that. Or maybe you're like, hmm. I am a great writer and I want to uh, write books. Ha! Huh. I want to be a published author. Or maybe you want to be a ghost writer or a proofreader or an editor for authors. If that is a strong suit and that's something that you, you know, put off out of fear or because, you know, you, there wasn't the support you had, you know, coming up, this may be a great pivot for you before, during, whatever, um, retirement. It's, it's just a great pivot. Um, something else, online courses. The We're looking at the online learning training markets expected to exceed over $200 billion by 2024. So if you have a skill that you think other people are willing to pay for and you're good at explaining things, you could really tap into that market. Um, creating one or more courses that teach online. You can have it automated and boom, just roll with it. So 
Um, you can use online marketplaces such as Udemy or you can use your own website or other platforms to deliver your course. So it's a great option. And um, another is what is really crazy. The National Association of Professional Pet Sitters estimates that Americans spend roughly $47 billion a year on their fur babies. So that means there's plenty of opportunities to earn money in this field. So if you love dogs and cats and you could be a pet walker, pet sitter, groomer, trainer, and more, you can have a full-on business And trust me, (laughs) there are people that will pay top dollar, especially if the services and the products that you sell are um, top notch, premium, whatever. But even if not, if you just, you know, want to provide some services and products at reasonable rates, people will definitely, ah, yeah, we love our fur babies. Um, So something else I've mentioned earlier about franchises. So we have our franchisees. In the U.S. alone, there are nearly 760,000 franchise establishments, and they're generating about $760 billion. And when you look at the numbers, some franchisees have higher success rates than independent startups like retail stores and restaurants. So that's something to really consider. So for best results... um, It is always recommended that you choose a franchise that's in an industry that you are really comfortable with, that you are possibly passionate about, (laughs) Uh, right? That you are just like gung ho over, and research the your choices very carefully before signing a contract because it's a contract, and you don't want to get caught up, and you don't want to miss the loopholes or miss the things that will have you locked into something and bearing a lot of financial and legal weight. So um, just be mindful of that, right? Because I think some people forget that a franchise is still a business. (laughs) So um, be mindful of that. Some other ideas I want to just roll out really quick. Um, You know, a bed and breakfast owner, a photographer, um, you know, and back to the bed and breakfast really quick, because there's some pivots in that. Um, if you, you know, put your primary home or secondary home um, for Airbnb or something like that, where you can be able to, um, it's a great revenue source right there. Um, but bed and breakfast owner, photographer, tour guide, uh, patient advocate, a education advocate. So, you know, you can help parents who oftentimes face uphill battles when trying to get the best level of care and attention and service for their students who are in grades K through 12. So you can help through so many different ways, including like an IEP process. It's just, there's a lot that that you can um, benefit parents and their children. Another business opportunity is being a handyman. If you're really good um, at it. And that's something that, um, you're, you know, you're passionate about. You want to strap on that belt and get in there and get some work done. (laughs) And then, um, last but not least is an event planner. So we're looking at the, um, a projected growth of 18% between 2020 and 2030, where professional event planning, um, can definitely be a great second career. Um, especially if you have a, an impeccable attention to detail and you are relentless with your resourcefulness. Like if you are the king or queen of resources, then it's definitely um, something to consider. And it can be something that you do as a dual career with what you're currently doing. It can be something that you do part-time. It could be something as part of a rewirement strategy. So those are just a few business ideas. Of course, the sky is the limit or the the limit is as far as you will allow yourself to go. And um, I always just say, you know, what are you good and great at? And start from there. Let's look at your strengths um, and start from there. A lot of times people are like, well, you know, I'm not good at this. Okay, don't worry about what you're not good at. What are you good at? What are you great at? Because you'll find people that are good and great in the areas where you're not. Okay, so um, there is a quote from T.S. Eliot that says, only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. And I I really want to underline that fact. Um, Some of you may not actually pursue and 
embrace the dreams that you've had nestled in your mind and heart for decades because you're not willing to take that risk to to step out there. I'm telling you now, um, do it. Step out there. Try it. It's like the the worst that can happen is that, well, the worst that can happen is you never did. And you, you leave this level of existence with a woulda, shoulda, coulda, with regret. That's the worst. You never tried. So you don't even know. You don't know what you don't know. So um, I want to give some shout outs to two boomers. Uh, some shout outs. Some business owners. We have uh, Maura Gehring, who at the age of 65 launched the Boodle Body. The Boodle Body, a CBD infused skincare line in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Ooh, you know, it is hot and dry <laughs> in New Mexico. And on um, her website, it says they, are, um, they offer a variable Boodle of full spectrum hemp distillate infused skincare products made in Santa Fe, New Mexico that soothe, improve, and hydrate your skin. Um, they have something for you from your forehead to your toes. Oh my goodness, their products. I even like how they 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 package it, like how they the the branding of it is really cool. They put some great love and care in that. Um, they even have gift cards if you want to be able to, you know, treat someone, but you don't know specifically what they would like. They have gift card options. So I will make sure to provide um, all of their contact information. Um, they're on Instagram at Boodle Body, B-O-O-D-L-E Body. Um, they're also on Facebook at Boodle Body and, um, their website is BoodleBody.com and their phone number is area code 505-467-8647. That's 505-467-8647. Please support Boodle Body. I love it. And then our second business owners, we have, oh, this is an amazing story um, as well. We have Dawn Fleming. Dawn is a former attorney turned vacation rental entrepreneur. So um, she and her husband were hit extremely hard during the 2008 financial crisis and it left them financially struggling, struggling. They were unable to find work. So they had to relocate from California to Florida and they had to start all over and rebuild everything finances and everything else. I'm sure their, their pride, their everything else. Um, and she and her husband decided to just take a leap of faith and they purchased an oceanfront home on Isla Mujeres, Mexico in 2016. And they converted it into a micro hotel that's called the uh, Castellito del Caribe. And after being asked repeatedly for tips on how to retire overseas, she launched a podcast called Overseas Life Redesign. And then <laughs> she launched a, co- a coaching company by the same name. And she wrote a book and it's called Claim Your Dream Life. Um, and it's about retiring abroad. Don't you love it? You see how that happens? It just starts spinning. It just it just manifests. It's beautiful. So I want to really quick share some um, details about their property. According to their website, it's two short blocks to the ferry. So it's two short blocks to the ferry to El Centro, which is downtown, uh, Hildago Street restaurants, shops and nightlife. And it's a short walk to North Beach, which has been consistently ranked as a top 10 beach in the world. And they have expansive views, of course, the turquoise and sapphire um, Caribbean Sea. And their property, this is when you go and you see the photos, it's just amazing. They have waves breaking just 12 feet from the property. So they have various uh, configuration options for their villas. They have a Four bedroom, four bath villa, and they have six rental options depending on availability. And there are four terraces, two are on the east side of the property. They all have an amazing view of the sea. They also have a new rooftop terrace that has panoramic 360 views of the entire island. So you got to check them out 
Um, their website is uh, Costa Yito Caribe. That's C A S T I L L I T O C A R I B E dot com. I will, of course, provide the link as always. Is that, oh my goodness, like these are just two examples of you're sitting back and you're like, you know, I can either let life clobber me and I just lay down. <laughs> Or I get myself up and I reimagine it and I try something totally new, totally different. You know, when I mentioned, um, and I don't think I, I said, but, you know, Boodle Body, you know, uh, Mora and her, and she and her husband, they moved to Santa Fe, Mexico, New Mexico. And she says that, you know, oh, what the, what's out there is you see dirt and they're so close to the sun. And it was based on her experience of that heat and the sun pounding down on her. She says, whoa. And she, there was a need and she quickly filled it. And so it's, these are just the things that, um, you know, we, I say regardless of age, but I'm stressing this with my baby boomers because I understand there's so much uncertainty and there's a lot of risk, especially because now you're, you're going to be gambling with, you know, funds that you have or that you thought you would have or that you will have um, for retirement um, and you're now trying to take all these things in consideration. So um, I just wanted to share those two as my business shout outs for today and inspire you and encourage you um, to just step out there on faith and to get all of the information that you need. Do the research Yes, you're going to have to do more due diligence than the 20-year-old startup. And the only reason why is because the 20-year-old still has 40 to 60 years to drop and fail and drop and fail and and get back up. And yes, you don't have, um, you know, 60 years (laughs) to drop and fail with a business startup yourself. So there are some ways in which you have to position yourself and to be more cautious and, um, but not fear based, right? So it's, it's just being more strategic and tactical in your approach. And, um, just knowing that you have to just be, um, making sure that you're more informed and you're not just jumping out there, um, like you would at age 20, if, if that was your personality then. And so I just want to make sure that, I share that, but I hope that with that, you are um, encouraged to really sit back and to, to think about what it is that you really want, right? How do you want to spend the next 20, 30, 40 years? How and with whom and where and doing what? So, oh, you know what that is, folks. Is that time again? Um, time to wrap up and it's time to go our separate ways. And, you know, until next week. Um, if you have any questions or suggestions about the show, please email them to us at don't call it smallbiz at gmail.com. I want to wrap up with a quote. Um, this has just really been a, I'm kind of a little bit emotional with this. Because um, I get, I get the, um, I get the stress. I get the, the fear. So here's a quote from Simone de Beauvoir. Change your life today. Don't gamble on the future. Act now without delay. So with that, be sure to check us out on Facebook at Foreman and Associates on Instagram and Twitter at Foreman LLC. Of course, you know that we now have a um, Instagram for this uh, podcast. Yeah. Um, Where it don't call it small. And then our Twitter handle is it ain't small. And be sure to, you know, share us with your friends and family and colleagues. And you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Natasha L. Foreman. Reach out to me, say hello, share your story. I do, do, do want to meet you. Um, Shout out to Shane Ivers for this amazing song. It's called Higher Up. And thank you guys. I seriously, I mean it. I want to thank you for always um, tuning in to the Don't Call the Small Business podcast, for sharing these episodes with others and for your continued support. 
And don't forget what I tell you on each and every episode. Don't call what you're planning, thinking, dreaming, or doing little or small. Go big, go bold, or go nowhere. I'll see you all here next week. Thank you so much. I love you all.